We're going to begin today with reviewing math skills and skills problems areas. Your midterm exam will be at college level, so yes, we understand that you're teaching primary mathematics, that this class is about teaching, but at the same time, you have to have your own math skills solidified well beyond first grade, second grade, third grade. And most of those skills involve fraction math and long division and then some decimal math when we have problems. So let's go back to fraction math. So I want to ask you, can you reduce fractions at college level? Can you add and subtract fractions and mixed numbers at college level with the harder denominators. Can you multiply and divide fractions? Probably they're not too hard, but the numbers are going to, um, we're going to increase the numbers, uh, the size of the numbers and get a little away from your multiplication tables. So can you do arithmetic at college level? Can you do long division efficiently? Can you do percent math even? Okay. So the first thing I want to do is review fraction reducing. Okay, fraction reducing. As um, the first thing in your, your skills, we're dealing with your skills. I'm taking a break from teaching primary and how are your math skills? Can you do math at college level? So think about fractions. How's your fraction math? What are you weak in? Um, typically, reducing can be a problem. Reducing when you go above and beyond your times tables. Another problem is least common denominator versus greatest common factor. These things are on that test. They are on the midterm exam. I am deliberately testing your math skills. Nothing to do with primary. So can you reduce numbers that have uh, numerators and denominators that are larger? Can you tell and remember the difference between least common denominator, greatest common factor? How are your addition skills? Does it take you too long to find a common denominator? Okay, that's usually the problem. It takes me too long to find the common denominator. I give up and go on. Not so much the multiplication and division. Okay, but can you do addition and then also subtraction? I'll put a T there. Subtraction, multiplication and division of fractions. So those are your basic fraction skills. This guy's a problem. This, these two are always confused. We're pretty much okay here. Sometimes we have trouble with subtraction because of the same common denominator problem. But then we have to go further. Can I relate them to decimals? Can I move back and forth between the fraction and decimal equivalents? Can I tell order? All right, what's bigger? 13 fourteenths or 15 sixteenths? Can I tell order between two fractions? Can I tell the order between a fraction and a decimal? So a little bit beyond just the basic things that you may, are, you may have trouble with these kind of carried over from high school. So let's deal with a few of them. Let's begin with this. This is a classic area where many people are confused and they, they can't 
off the top of their head, they're going to give me the wrong answer. So if I have the number 14 and 16, what's the least common multiple? What's the greatest common factor? Two. What is two? The greatest common factor. Yes, two is the greatest common factor. What's the least common uh, put denominator? Least common multiple is the least common denominator. What if I had this? Maybe I shouldn't say if. When I have this, and I want you to tell me greater than or less than, what are you going to do? Guess and hope for the best? <coughs> no. You have to find the least common multiple, and then you will be able to see. Here, whenever we make a comparison, we can't compare things that are in two different denominations or two different forms. So we get the common denominator and then we can tell. So least common multiple, 14 is 2 times 7. 16 is 4 times 4, which is 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. So the least common multiple is going to be 16 times 7. Okay, and this is, these aren't, you don't know your times tables here. So you have to have a way to figure this out. How do I know that? Here's the least common multiple. So it's going to be 16 times 7. What is 16 times 7? going to be uh, 42. What's that? 112. Yes, it is 112. That's something that you're just going to come up with off the top of your head. So you have to have a way to figure it out without doing all this randomness. Are you going to use 14 times 16 as your common denominator or your least common multiple? There's no need to. This is the thing that we did before just a little bit, and I mostly did it in intermediate. So here it is again. What's a prime number? What's a composite number? This will be how you could reduce this. This is how you can reduce larger numbers, and this is also how you can pick your common denominator. If I were to give you a problem, which fraction is actually larger? You cannot tell by looking at it because they're too close. So what you would have to do is get your common denominator 112. Then you can accurately make a comparison. You never compare unlike quantities. You convert them to the same form and then the comparison is obvious. So I would have to find a common denominator between 14 and 16 and see which numerator is bigger. Then it will be obvious when they're in the same denomination. So we just said that 112 is the least common multiple. And in this prime factored form, this composite, we can play all kinds of games with it. There's 14, right? Here's 16. A common denominator is they share a 2. Literally, when I have this in uh, prime factor form, they literally share this 2, don't they? How many times does 16 go into 112? 7 times. So 7 times 15. What's 7 times 15? It's going to be, what, 105. So 16 goes into 112 seven times, so I multiply by seven to adjust the numerator. How many times does 14 go into 112? Eight, here it is. And then eight times 13 is, well, what's eight times 12? It's 104 because eight times 12 is 96. So which fraction is larger? this guy. Do you see how close they are? There's no way you can tell by looking. All you'd be doing is guessing. 
15 sixteenths is only slightly larger than 13 fourteenths. So <coughs> when you make any comparison, you always compare, it's kind of like the law of addition. I can't compare quantities with certainty until I convert them in the same form. So on that midterm, you're going to have to give me the order between two fractions. And don't guess. Find a common denominator, and then it's quite easy because 105 is greater than 104. 105 is greater than 104. So I know with confidence that 15 sixteenths is the larger number. So then I can put in my order symbol and I will use less than. 13 fourteenths is less than 15 sixteenths. Okay, there's, there's no guessing with mathematics. If you need to compare quantities, put them in the same form, and you will do that through the least common multiple or the least common denominator. And one of the best ways to choose your least common multiple, no matter why you need it, is prime factored form. And what you will do is you'll assemble the smallest composite. The least common multiple is always the smallest composite that contains the factors of each without any extra. I am not going to use 16 times 14. I have this overlapping 2, and there's no reason to use, what, 224. Too big. I don't want to deal with 224. There's no reason to use their product because they share a common factor of 2. So whenever I have to work with numbers that are too big for me, because I don't know times tables in 16s and 14s, I can go to prime factored form and work with them in factored form. Then it's easier for me to actually figure out what the new numerator needs to be. It's easier for me to see immediately which fraction is larger. And then it's never a matter of taking a guess or flipping a coin. So least common multiple versus greatest common factor. This is a multiple. This is individually is a factor. So students are going to have trouble with least common multiple versus greatest common factor nonstop. Now as a primary teacher, you won't teach that, will you? Okay, but what will you do? And Kelly, what did you ha what were you teaching on your primary lesson just last week? Factor. What is the root? What is the root of the problem here? Jessica got it right. She told me the greatest common factor was two. And that's because you concentrated on the word factor versus the word multiple. Students mix this up constantly because they get their brain gets hung up on this word here. How can 212 be least? Well, it is least common multiple. It's not a small number. It's not least. So when they see least, they think, oh, it's got to be 2 and greatest. So if I have 14 and 16 and I'm asking, what's the least common multiple? My brain wants to say 2. So there's two ways to combat this. This looks weird. Least common <coughs> multiple is 112. The greatest common factor is 2. This begins with primary math. Perfect illustration. Teaching them what factors are. So when I say factor, I'm going to think what times, not multiples, how many times. So 2 is not a multiple of 14, is it? 2 is a factor of 14. So here we have a failure in the first step of our teaching progression, terminology. So as a primary teacher, you are responsible for terminology. In second grade is the word factor. So we have to not just teach it for our work page for Friday's lesson. We have to use that word. And you see how it's unfamiliar to them, and they, they miss, some of them missed the boat, didn't they? Okay? And so that's one thing why we're take, you're taking this class, is so you start realizing those things. 
okay? So if we have a failure to use the terminology factor and multiple, we're going to have a failure in upper grades because we're going to constantly confuse things that should never be confused. What are the multiples of 14? 14 times 1, 14 times 2, 14 times 3, etc. Right? What are the multiples of 16? 16, 32, 48, etc. So we have to use terminology from the very beginning. And so if you're weak on your own personal terminology, your brain's going to get hung up on this word and this word. So often in seventh grade, I will deliberately not say least and greatest. I'll ask them for the common multiple. And then they're a whole lot less likely to say two. Okay? Many, many students mix this up simply because of they're not used to the terminology. They know what a factor is, but practically speaking, they don't use it. They might know what a multiple is once I start doing it for them, but they don't know themselves. So greatest common, least common multiple versus greatest common factor, that confusion area stems back to not knowing the terminology. Yes? Could you say something? first common multiple instead of least? I just say common multiple. And even when I'm teaching with denominators or I'm reviewing it or I'm tutoring with it, I say find the common denominator. I don't even use the word least. Many students, junior high students, who are struggling with their fraction math, I get this problem. They almost exclusively, when I ask for the least common multiple, they'll say two. Okay. Well, that's not even a multiple. It doesn't make any sense. Okay. This, you probably, I don't know if you remembered mixing these two up. Okay. So there's, there's a couple different ways we can attack this. Learning and using the terminology from grade two. Okay. will help this. The other thing is, I am going to de-emphasize the adjective. And I will say, common multiple, common factor, because then that their brain kind of gets stumbles over and gets stuck with the greatest and the least. Okay. So, um, a lot of times that will happen. And then the other way here to me is another technique that you can use to teach from when you have a confusion, you give them a way to check themselves better. And in fact, I do it with the college class. I never assign 2.1 first, or I even skip it altogether. The first section in your college uh, basic math book for fractions is section 2.1, and it's least common multiple and greatest common factor. It throws it to you at the same time. And many college students actually mess up 2.1. The best thing to do is to, when you're reviewing it, and we're tutoring when the problem already exists, is we will skip to the application. And then I teach least common multiple is kind of an abstract idea. If I solidify it in its application, I say, oh no, least common denominator is least common multiple. So if I ask you for the least common multiple between 14 and 16, if I phrase it, what would you use if you had to add 5 fourteenths and 7 sixteenths. Nobody's going to say 2. So if you root them in their application, what's the application of greatest common factor? What is it used for? It's used for reducing. So um, if we review the reducing in the common denominator, then we can relate it backwards and maybe clear up the confusion. Now, ideally, there would be no confusion because we already understand factor and multiple and we use factor and multiple. But when there already is confusion, we can do a tether. How about if I have a problem? I have, remember, problem areas in our progression. Problem areas are areas where two concepts can be confused. 
That's one type of problem area. Another problem area is when the procedure gets tedious, right? Here's an example of a problem area, which is what we're going over, where we have two concepts that are frequently and very easily confused. It's very easy to understand how it gets confused. So what I want to do is I want to tether it to something I won't confuse as a college student. I know how to find a common denominator. And I know how to reduce as a college student. Or even as a seventh grader, if I have this problem in seventh grade, they know how to find a common denominator. They know how to reduce. So I say, no, greatest common factor is what to reduce. So if I ask you four, I've got 14 and 16, and I ask you for both the least common multiple and the greatest common factor, I can ask you that and I can see the confusion on your face. You don't know what to say. I can say, okay. What would you use to reduce 16 fourteenths? What would you use, Tamar, to reduce 14 sixteenths? What would you use to reduce it? What would you use, Kelly? You'd use two. Two is used for reducing because two is the what? greatest common factor. So I keep saying it. Terminology, terminology. What is the key with terminology? Use it. Okay? And so we have to keep using it. It's a mistake to just introduce it for a lesson and then leave it alone. We have to use it. So greatest common factor can be tethered to its application, which is reducing. So how do I reduce? I div divide the numerator and the denominator by what? The greatest common factor. So if I can't remember which one's which, I'm gonna start tethering it to its use. The greatest common factor is used to reduce. So then I can jog your mind. What would you use to reduce? 14, 14 sixteenths. You would use two. Why? Two is the greatest common factor. All right, and back over here. What would you use if you had to add fourteenths and sixteenths? Not using two, are you? You what would be? They're not going to be able to answer that one off the top of their head, but at least they'll know it's not two, is it? So the adjective is very misleading. And that's why many people confuse it, especially when you go back to school as a college student and it's been years since you did arithmetic. You're gonna have confusing areas and you're gonna need to brush up on your own basic skills. So this is how you handle problem area because you're gonna have problems with this terminology. That's the root, but you can't do anything about that. Oh, they should have learned factor and multiple in grade two. Well, maybe so, but how are you gonna fix the problem now in grade seven? Okay, so least common multiple and greatest common factor is a failure of terminology, but it can be corrected by relating it to something they've already mastered. Remember, a te teaching technique is to relate the unknown to the known. Well, we can also relate the confused to something that's not confused, okay? Tether. You've got to have information tethered or it gets lost and confused. All right, so if you get confused between what number is I give you two numbers, how about 18 and 24? Greatest common factor, least common multiple. I'm, I'm gonna do, and I'm a math teacher. I'm gonna go to the easy and familiar. What would I use to reduce 18 24s? Desiree, what would you use? Six. So what is six called? Greatest common factor. So GCF, is six and we can check if I do use six is this in lowest terms yes so I can be confident that six is the greatest common factor what would you use if you had 
an addition or subtraction problem. What would you use for your common denominator? What is the least common denominator? Well, that's going to be the least common multiple, isn't it? What would you use? That's a little big. But you've got to be able to handle a little big as a college student. So what is 18? It's 2 times 9. Right? What is 24? Well, I think 3 times 8, right off the top of my head. So it's 3 times 2 times 2 times 2. Here's 8. Here's 3. 24 is 3 times 8. What's the least common multiple? Well, let's find a nice composite that contains the factors of each. Here's 24, here's 18. See the overlap again? This is the least common multiple. And there's the greatest common factor. So I am going to use 72. 8 times 9. So what's my least common multiple? 72. Because when I ask for least common multiple, your brain's going to want to think 6 because 6 is least. But we're not dealing with least and greatest, really. We're dealing with factor versus multiple. So how do I use greatest common factor? I use it to reduce. So if I need the greatest common factor between two numbers, just think about <coughs> what would I use if I had to reduce that in a fraction? Or if I had to find greatest common multiple, think, oh, LCM is no different than LCD. What would I use if I had 18ths and 24ths? And then if I do assemble my least common multiple in composite in the, if this is a composite. If I assemble it in its prime factored form, I can easily see how many times does 18 go into 72. How many times have I showed you this to you? Then you don't have to do scrap paper. We don't want that. You see how I chose the least common multiple, which I'm going to use for my least common denominator. So let's say I have 7 18ths and 11 24 and I'm supposed to add them. How many times does 18 go into 72? Here's 18. What do I need? 4. 4 times 7 is 28. This is going to help me with the problem altogether. So I'm not sitting there frustrated and doing all this scrap work where I'm going to make little tiny multiplication errors and the whole problem is off. Okay. And then the problem is not a reflection of your fraction skills. It becomes a reflection of your lack of math skills, of just basic ideas of what these things are. So can you see that 18 goes into 72? Here's 18 sitting right here. Here's 24. All I need is a 4. How many times does 24 go into 72? Well, here's 24. All I need is a times 3 to complete my least common multiple. So 3 times 11 is 33. That's going to give me 11, 61, 70 seconds. Okay? So sometimes you miss a lot of this stuff. In a, you don't show this to fourth graders. But now, this should be a way that you can get this stuff, put some of your math skill problems behind you. Okay, we are taking it up to college level. And so on your midterm, I am not going to give you denominators like 8 and 16. That's not college level. I'm going to give you 18 and 24. Or I'm going to give you 36. And how about 36 and 14? Because the biggest problem that we have with our fraction math is the fact that it takes me too long to find a common denominator. 
and then I make a dumb mistake when I'm fixing, when I'm raising my uh, denominator to higher terms, I make a dumb mistake in the equivalent fraction. My numerator's off because I multiply wrong. All right, let's do 14 and 36. Greatest common factor is only two. If I had to reduce this, it really wouldn't be a big deal, would it? Is that in lowest terms? Two is the greatest common factor. So that means there's 14. 14 is two times seven. 36, first thing I think with 36 is four times nine or six times six, right? So it's gonna be four times nine. I like to go with that so that the twos are together and the threes are together instead of six times six. So, here is 36. Here is 27. I'm not 27. 14. There's 14. How many times, what's the, what's the least common multiple then? It's going to be 36 times 7, isn't it? which is 252. Then I have, maybe I do have to do a multiplication, but not a whole bunch of them. Okay, 252. That doesn't sound very least to me, does it? But it is the least common multiple because there's not a lot of commonality between 14 and 36. Here's the only overlap, see the overlap? between the prime factored form of the 36 and the prime factored form of the 14. Greatest common factor is two, least common multiple is 252. So, if then, let me scoot that over, three, three, two, two, seven, 14, um, 36, what am I going to do if I have to add 5 and 9 fourteenths plus 6 and 7 thirty-sixths? That's not a very common problem, is it? But that is a college level problem, 36 and 14. So. I'm going to form equivalent fractions. 252. I won't even do that to you. Not on a test. But if I did, how many times does 36 go into 252? 36 into 252. How many times? Seven. It's right here. This time it's in white and black, not black and white. Right? But there it is. Seven. So, seven times seven is 49. How many times does 14 go into 252? What is this? Here it is. This part right here is left. Those factors are left. So that is nine times two, which is 18. I don't know what 14 times 18 is. Now I do. It's 252. Right? So I'm going to do 9 times 18. All right, I might have to multiply that out on scrap paper, but at least I get a ballpark and I don't have to do division and multiplication. 8 times 9 is 72. Right? Actually, 9 times 8 is 72, carry the 7, 9 times 1 plus 7, 162. Then I can do my addition. Add my whole numbers so I don't forget them. Bring down my common denominator, and then I get 11, 11 to 11. Kind of an odd problem, isn't it? But if you have an understanding of what least common multiple really is, 
and the fact what prime and composites are and how they can help you with the larger numbers. You do not have to do you do not have to do all this scrap work, <coughs> multiplication and division problems. When you need to work with a larger number, just put it in prime factored form and then you can see what it's made of and then you can choose your common denominator and so forth. Okay? So, can you then do both reducing and least common denominator, greatest common factor? Can you do them efficiently? Um, we've talked about reducing before. How do you reduce? You divide by the greatest common factor. You divide the numerator by the greatest common factor and the denominator by the greatest common factor. What if you can't see it? Prime factor it. Okay. In um, algebra we work with coefficients, variables, exponents, and so forth. But if I had an algebra problem here, let's say I had 12x squared y and then I had um, 48x y. How am I going to do that? Well, I can prime factor it. This is going to be, um, I don't even need to prime factor, but I will. Here's 12, here's x, here's y. Isn't that what that means? And this is going to be 8 times 3 is 24, so 16 times 3 is 48 times x times y. Then what do I do? In algebra class, I just have all kinds of fun canceling. So I have x over 4, right? I would, this is easy numbers. What are you doing when you say 12 goes into 12 one time, 12 goes into 48 four times? You're doing a cancellation mentally of common factors. What's the greatest common factor between 12 and 48? There it is. It's 12 itself. And then what is x? I just cancel this x with this x, cancel this y. I cancel common factors. That's how I reduce. I can do that with, in arithmetic. I just write it all out in common factored form and away I go with my cancellation. Okay, so if I have some bigger numbers like 144 over 216, what am I going to do? I can start random division, but I don't do anything in a random. I'm going to prime factor. Think about 144. I think about it as being 12 times 12, right? So that means I need um, here's a 12, here's a 12. So it's going to be 16 times 9. 216, oh, I don't know 216. It's not in my times table range. So what do I do? Do you know how to use division by primes? 2, 3, 5, 7, 11. Those are your basic prime numbers. Start with 2. 2 goes into 2 once, nothing left over. 2 does not go into 1. Bring, use a 0, 2 goes into 16. And I keep dividing. Oh, I'm just going to go into 5 twice. 27. 2 doesn't go in anymore, so I start with 3. And I keep going. Okay? So this is going to be 2, 2, 2, 3, 3, 3. So if I had 144 and 216, what's the greatest common factor? <coughs> 2, 2, 3, 3. <laughs> Look where that guy goes. Two thirds. This is the kind of reducing you're going to see from me. So you have a choice. You can start doing all this random division or you can 
take that large number that is too big, it's beyond your times tables, prime factor it. Okay? There are two ways to prime factor. Factoring tree. But that kind of requires that kind of requires that you know your that it's in your times table range. The best way to prime factor a large number that's out of your times table range, like 216, is you do division by primes. Start with 2. How many times? <coughs> keep using it. Then go to 3. Keep using it until you're down to all prime numbers. Okay? That's called short division, too, which we do teach. Being able to do this in your head. 2 into 2 is 16. 2 goes into 2 once. 2 does not go into 1, so it goes 0 times. And that 1 goes to the 6. 8. Okay, so then this becomes not a problem with reducing. If I take my larger number and I break it into my prime factors, and then I cancel all the common factors. So my greatest common factor is 8 times 9, which is 72. And when I have it in prime factor form, I can do all kinds of multiplication with it. Okay, that's how we work with bigger numbers. Because I see 8 and I see 9. You see 8 and see the 9. So my greatest common factor there is 72. How many, how many little is that going to take you to get down to 2 thirds? You're going to be doing it for 10 minutes. It's much easier to, when you have these, a big reducing problem, prime factor it, pretend you're in algebra class, write out your factors, and cancel the common ones. Okay, so can you reduce at college level? Can you find a common denominator at college level? Can you do the fraction math? All right, let's review one more thing. Let's review the three denominator scenarios or situations. Three scenarios or situations. This is how they're taught beginning in about fourth grade. The easiest situation <coughs> Denominator scenario number one is when the smaller denominator is a factor of the larger denominator. Notice I avoided the little phrase, goes into. That's not how you use your terminology. The smaller denominator, if it goes into, the larger denominator means it's a factor of. Okay, so if I have to add, 3 fourths plus 7 eighths. This is denominator scenario number one. The smaller denominator is a factor of the larger denominator. Okay, this is a problem area. We constantly have trouble and it takes us too long to find the common denominator. Okay, and so this is easy, but this isn't going to be college level. I will use 8, won't I? Denominator scenario number one. That's automatically. So if the smaller denominator is a factor of the larger denominator, I will automatically, both the least common denominator and the least common multiple will be the large denominator. In the case of four and eight, four is a factor of eight, so the common multiple, least common multiple, least common denominator is the eight is the larger denominator. The next one is, is when the denominators are prime to each other. That means they share no common factors. The denominators are um, also said to be relatively prime. That doesn't mean they're prime numbers, it means they're prime to each other. So if I had 3 fourths plus 2 fifths, Two or four and five are relatively prime. They're prime to each other. That means they have no common factors. 
automatically we are stuck. <coughs> when they are primed to each other, then the least common denominator or least common multiple is the product of the two. It's their product. Okay? So automatically, what's the denominator here? 20. We don't have any choice but just to use the 4 and the 5, right? And then I proceed to get my equivalent fractions formed and so on. Here's where we have a problem. When the denominators share common factors. When the denominators share common factors, the least common multiple, least common denominator is the product of the two divided by the greatest common factor. Or a better way to put it, it's going to be the smallest composite, least, that contains the factors of each, as we've gone over a few minutes ago. like the 14 and the 36, or the 18 and the 24. Let's do an uh, easier one. Let's start with 18 and 12. I want to add 5 eighteenths and 7 twelfths. 18 is outside my times table range. I don't know my times tables for 18. What I can do is I can center in on the word multiple and I can start writing the multiples of 18. 18 times 1, 18 times 2, until I, oh, look at that. 18 times 2 is 36. I recognize 36 as a multiple of 12 because I do know my 12 times table. So I can just start writing multiples because this tell, you've got to keep in mind least common denominator, least common multiple, same thing. So I will use 36. That's because 36 is the smallest composite that contains the prime factors of each. Um, 18 is 2 times 9, 12 is 4 times 3, so all I need is that extra 2. Here's 36, the least common multiple. Inside my 36, I see my 12, and I see my 18, and I see my greatest common factor is 6. Greatest common factor is 6, least common multiple is 36. And this will give me 21 times 3, so times 3, times 2, so times 2, so I get 31 36 as my sum. Okay, so if you need to find a common de denominator, you can do a couple different things. You can remember least common denominator is the least common multiple, so I can start manually writing multiples. 36 is 2 times 18 and 3 times 12. Or I can prime factor them and assemble the smallest composite that contains the factors of each. So 36 is the least common multiple, 6 is the greatest common factor. Okay. Many times when we start introducing the words factor and multiples, we think they don't have a lot of use for them, but you're setting the foundation. So this goes back to the importance of primary. You're setting the foundation. So they need to learn in grade two factor and multiple. You need to drill factor and multiple. And even more important than that, you need to use factor and multiple. Okay, Because that's what it is. But many times students simply will not see that. And they're so focused on just doing their math page. And as a second grader, they have to learn how to spell the word factor, right? 
they don't even know how to spell it. They don't know what it is. So we have to set our foundation. So as you teach, be very, very careful about going through stuff in the curriculum and thinking, oh, they don't need that. Well, of course not. They're in grade two. But eventually they're going to be in grade seven. Okay? And so forth. So the, one of the biggest problem areas with college students, with high school students, with junior high, is they're coming out of elementary and they don't have fraction math skills. And then you got to play catch up, which is no fun. But you need to make sure that you yourself can add, subtract, multiply, and divide with fractions quickly and efficiently. Okay? Um, and the biggest problem is common denominators. Can also, we can also have a problem with borrowing. We've reviewed the borrowing before. Make sure that you can borrow. All right, the midterm, um, the midterm is a math skills test. And several of you, the tendency in this class is you do well on the teaching part, and then you're, you're not doing well on the math skills part, which is, for me, scary. We don't want you coming out of college with lack of math skills, okay? Because you say, well, I don't know what I'm gonna do five years down the road, 10 years down the road. That's true. <coughs> but more than likely, you're going to be a teacher and you have no idea at what level. And more than likely too, you might have to be teaching at multiple levels. You might have to homeschool or you might have to use a very small, be in a very small school situation, okay? Um, just the way things are nowadays is we don't have very many big Christian schools like we did in the 1970s and the 1980s and 1990s even. Even our school is smaller than it used to be. Okay? So you've got to make sure that you have your math skills. Probably you're going to be mom someday and you're going to have to make sure that your own students, your own children, you might have to teach them and you're going to have to make sure that they have math skills or you're going to be working with other people's children, or you're going to be on the mission field and you're going to be working with fellow missionary students, right? Their children and your own children and then children in your church and so forth. So math skills are important. And many times they get, we get the attitude, I'm not good at math. Well, that's not going to cut it anymore, okay? And so there's no reason for you not to be better than you've been in math. All right, so fraction math skills. We spent several days on them. Your homework was about addition and subtraction. Um, your next assignment is over multiplication and division. Okay, don't forget those are the easy ones. Students don't get hung up on them. No common denominator, yay. So remember, what's the key about Fraction, multiplication, fraction, division. We can boil it all down to the same type of problem. Every problem has to be arranged to this. Fraction times fraction. Remember we went over this? Make sure that you get that. And don't forget the idea of the cross-canceling so that you don't have to do this gargantuan arithmetic problem. You can just simply multiply numerators and denominators with cancellation. So, if I have what's the only way you can do that problem? In the form fraction times fraction. In this case, improper fraction times improper fraction. Okay? Sometimes I make fun of the college students in seventh grade math because you know how many times I've gotten this answer? Somebody didn't retain the fact that the only way we can all multiply in fraction math is fraction times fraction. What do we have to do first? We have to go through the improper fraction form. This is going to be 15 plus 3 is 18 fifths. This is going to be 6 times 8 is 48 plus 7 is 55. 8. And then we can cross cancel. I am not doing 18 times 55. 
I don't want to do it any more than you do. So this is going to be 11. 2 goes into 8 4 times. 9. At least it's 99 fourths. And then we have to be efficient at converting our improper fraction to a mixed number. 4 is going to go into, well, 4 goes into 100 how many times? 25. 25. So this is going to be 24 and 3 fourths. Okay. All right. We will see you on Friday.